It's good to see all of y'all here today for the webinar, Is Your Corn Well Fed? Uh, this uh, webinar is an outgrowth of also a project that I'm doing in Pass St. County, also called Is Your Corn Well Fed? I am uh, doing uh, plant sampling with uh, a select group of growers uh, to help them to better understand about uh, plant sampling. Now today's webinar, the goal of it is, is to show how proper plant sampling and interpretation of results used in conjunction with other relevant information can aid in plant nutrition management decisions for corn. Now today's uh, speaker panel and also available to answer questions, we have with us today, Dr. Luke Gattaboni, Extension Crop and Soil Specialist, whose specialty area is fertility from North Carolina State University, Dr. David Hardy, Soil Testing Section Chief for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Dr. Ron Heidegger, Extension Crop and Soil Specialist, who uh, focuses on corn production from NC State University, Dr. Kristen Hicks, Plant Tissue Analysis Section Chief for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and Dr. Stephanie Caliza, Extension Crop and Soil Specialist, who focuses on nutrient management and utilization of poultry and livestock waste, also from North Carolina State University. Now, I just want to give you an overview of the agenda for the program today. First of all, I'll be giving you an overview of the program in Pasadena County, uh, also called Is Your Corn Well Fed, where I'm working with growers on plant sampling. Then Dr. Ron Heinegger is going to talk about corn nitrogen management in conjunction with plant sampling. Dr. Kristen Hicks will go into all the various aspects of plant sampling. And then lastly, we have uh, dedicated time for questions and answers. So let me, first of all, <clears throat> tell you a little bit about the program that I'm doing in Pasadena County. Um, the first goal is for growers to become more familiar with interpreting plant sample reports. Also, to, for growers to learn how to effectively use the tool in making nutrient, nutrient management decisions, as well as how to properly take a tissue sample so they get data that is useful for them. Also, I am trying to build a data set uh, in corn for Pasadena County, and also for me to gain more knowledge about this particular tool. Now, as far as implementation of this program, uh, I have su seven growers that I contacted and they agreed to be a part of it. Uh, in these, uh, with these seven growers, I asked them for a, a field. And in those fields, I selected a spot that I felt was representative. It was not at the ends of the fields or in areas that were not uh, what I felt like was representative of the field. Uh, in those uh, specific areas, uh, I am taking both a plant and soil samples. Uh, I will take those or have taken those at V5, V10, VT, and R2. Now, to just give you an idea about those growth stages, this is what a plant, a corn plant at V5 will look like. Then next here is what plants at V10 would look like. Then also, these, this is what plants at VT grow stage. Uh, as you can see, the newly uh, emerged tassel is out. You can see it in, in its entirety. And then lastly, this is R2. Uh, the ear has kernels that resemble blisters with a clear liquid. Now, in addition to those things uh, that, I, that has been done to implement this program, I will also be hand harvesting an area just adjacent to the area where I've been taking samples uh, for plant and soil, uh, but also be taking uh, yield and be hand harvesting. Uh, and the idea is to see how do these uh, plant samples that we've been taking, how does it translate into yield? Uh, this data has been shared with growers uh, as they are made available. And then also this data will be shared uh, either anonymous information of individual sites or collectively um, so that other growers can learn more about this very important tool, plant sampling. 
Now, one other thing that I want to point out is that there are some things that you need to consider in conjunction with plant sample reports or results. Uh, in fact, the submittal form for plant samples, they ask you these things on the form, such as growth stage. Uh, also, weather, whether it's, you know, the temperature, what it's been like, what's the rainfall been like. Also, uh, uh, the results on a plant sample report can be impacted about if the soil is too wet or too dry, uh, if there are hard pans that would limit the effective rooting depth, uh, if the soil chemistry is not right, such as pH, uh, that could uh, limit the, the rooting, effective rooting depth. Also pests that might would damage roots and then reduce its ability to take up nutrients or to plant health. All these are things that could impact the results of our plant samples. And also the genetics of the variety, if a variety has very good early season vigor, uh, that could impact results also. If a variety uh, is able to tolerate wet soils or not tolerate wet soils, that could impact the results that you see on the plant sample report, and there's uh, numerous other things. But all of these things have to be considered when we are looking at the results of the samples taken. Now, what I want to do is to go over the results of this study. I will, I'll be, I will be sharing both the plant and the soil report results. So what I want to do is now is to um, share with you the, um, the data that was gleaned from this sampling. Um, this first slide here, as I said, we, uh, I, there was a site picked out in each of the fields so that they, they somewhat represented the field. When I turn rows for doubling up fertilizer or well, that sort of thing or weird spots as far as soil types, but something hopefully it was close to representing the field. And uh, we took tissue and soil samples in at each of these growth stages um, at these sites. And this data here, this first we're looking at here is the plant nitrogen percentage as you can see across the bottom down here, we have the seven locations, P1 to P7. And then on the left-hand side here on the y-axis, we have the percent nitrogen. And then if you look on the legend on the right, we have here blue bar represents the values for percent nitrogen at each of the locations for percent nitrogen. Then V10, which is the orange or red one. Uh, the gray bar is VT. And then the yellow bar is R2. Now, in addition to that, there's different sufficiencies depending on the growth stage. And so you can see here across the bars, the blue line corresponds to the sufficiency for the V5. And we see that is 4%. Then we got 3% for early growth. And then I think from tasseling and maybe somewhat later, it is 2.8% nitrogen. Um, the value for at, at tasseling. So one thing that I thought was very interesting, if you look here, you see that the, um, there was a major drop. We go from as high as over 5% at this P3 here. At, uh, we noticed that for, and for every location that it dropped significantly when we went to V10. And this is most uh, due to a concentration difference. I mean, that's what we're measuring, measuring concentration. So as we get to V10, we got a period of rapid growth. So it's not necessarily meaning that we're not feeding it well necessarily, but we're, we're growing a lot more plant material, so the concentration is less. But as you can see, for most all of them, there was not any major issues uh, with these values. Now, we'll tell you this, if this study had been done last year or the previous three years, we probably would have had a much different set of data. There were not any really major glaring issues. Uh, Dr. Chris and I would say uh, that uh, was seen in these tissue samples. 
but there were some things that, that we did learn. But if you notice, we do see uh, a dropping in this, uh, the plant concentration of nitrogen. Now, next, now, because we don't have a soil test for nitrogen, we, I don't have corresponding values, but for everything else other than boron, which I'll show you, we do not have um, a uh, corresponding soil value. But next year, we've got phosphorus. The top table here is the, what is the percent phosphorus that is actually contained uh, in the plant. And then the bottom table here is the corresponding values uh, in index, in, as, as indexes for those samples. Again, you can see, one thing I should point, if you remember on nitrogen at uh, B5, we were looking at the range was actually from four to 5%, the range that it should be at for nitrogen. If you look here, you're looking at four tenths <coughs> of 1%. So we're looking at much lower concentration for this value, for this nutrient. But again, you do see some stair-stepping, dropping down as we get on to the V10 samples. Uh, in the, but uh, generally speaking, nothing really glaring here. I will tell you this, uh, at the V5, <coughs> I don't know what happened. I reckon I just got lucky and hit a spot that wasn't as good as other two samplings because if you look here the uh, for this uh, V5, but it seems to reflect it in the soils too. The, the values for the soils were, were lower uh, for V5. You look here, you see this was less than 50, but then the, the later samples in the soil were much higher. So I don't know what was going on there, except I just happened to put my probe where <laughs> the, there was not as many nutrients there for the soil. But we do even do, do see some, some mirroring uh, in the soil that we see in the tissue. So that gives you an idea uh, we can see there uh, for the phosphorus in the tissue as well as the soil, nothing really major that jumps out there. Next, this is potassium. Again, uh, at the top is the percent potassium in the, uh, in the plant. And then the bottom table is the uh, index values for the corresponding soil samples. One thing I do want to point out on this one, if you look up here at the tissue, again, we're looking at very high percentage compared to some other nutrients, the percent we need to have in the plant. So if we look up here at the plant uh, values at the top table, we see here that the sufficiency at seedling is 3%. All of them, most all of them except for one exception here, P7, uh, were well above that value. But one thing I want to point out, if we look at the uh, subsequent, the later samples, uh, sampling uh, the growth stages, we do see the values dropping in the tissue. But also if you drop down and look at, for any one of the locations, let's take for example, the P1. We see there what it is in the tissue, then we drop down here, we see that uh, what there are in the soil. And you see a definite stair-stepping, with maybe one exception, you see a definite stair-stepping of the values in the soil. And I was talking with Dr. Gattaboni about this, and he, he says that, uh, and chime in Dr. Gattaboni, that if you want to, that this is something that's very real. You see this, and it's because plant is sucking up so much uh, potassium, you can actually record it in the soil. Is that not correct? Yeah, because uh, potassium, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of uh, potassium that the plant will take up is, is very high. It's, it's compared to nitrogen in percentage, and so you can see the, the drop uh, in the soil. Whereas with phosphorus, you didn't see this stair-stepping like this. I mean, you did see a drop in the plants, but you didn't see the dramatic like you in the soil like you do because if you notice that it was less than four tenths of one percent even at uh, V5. Um, then next here, 
we had boron. This is something that's a, a, a concern of a lot of people and, and it is for me as well, because the last few years we've had a lot of um, uh, rainfall. We know that boron is leachable. In fact, Dr. Gettemon says the thing about boron, it's contained in the soil as not as an anion or as a cation, but it is a not charged. Well, how do we hold nutrients in the soil? It's by our exchange sites. And so it stays in soil solution. But the one thing I want to point out here, folks, I have not gotten back all the production data from all the locations, but I do know that this location P5 here, that that site had a pound of boron put on before planting, a pound of boron. And you can see it here. Now, maybe this P4 location, maybe that grower did too. In fact, I asked him and he wasn't certain, but I do know that this P5, and you definitely see here the values for boron, all this wave above sufficiency, you can see that the plants responded to that application of boron. I just point that out, and from what I can understand in talking with suppliers, uh, boron is about one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest plant materials that we can, can uh, supply. But I just wanted to share that with you. And then the last thing I wanted to share is this nitrogen sulfur ratio, uh, again, by growth stage and site. And we can see across the bottom the locations, P1 through P7. But then on the uh, left here, the values here are the ratio of nitrogen to sulfur. Now, if you look at the table, we have the blue line, which is the sufficiency value I mean, excuse yeah, sufficient value for the nitrogen sulfur ratio. And actually, if you look at the information that um, the Department of Agriculture's tissue lab or whatever uses, as well as other labs across the Southeast, is they're saying actually from 10 to 1 to 15 to 1. Well, we do have a, quite a few. Um, there was some that got above this red line, actually. When you get above 18 to 1, you are, that's a, uh, is a concern. But if they stay between 10 to 15 to 1, uh, that's seen as, as adequate. But we do have some that do go above that 15 to 1. So that's what I wanted to show as far as the data. So what do tissue sampling, what does tissue sampling do is, uh, first of all, Although observations as far as general color, as we look at the crop, if it looks good in color, that is a good measure. But tissue sampling in conjunction with soil sample gives us a quantitative measure of plant nutrition. It's like having, as you see down here, this gas gauge, it's like having a gas gauge, a gauge, a, a means of quantifying actually what is happening in those plants in your crop. And then lastly, Plant samples are, we have to keep this in mind, are a snapshot of the crop at that time. So a series of predictive samples give us a better picture. And then samples over years gives us an idea of plant nutrition for our soils, our weather, our management practices, and et cetera. Can you raise our hand? Yes. So with that, I'm going to... Hey, Al? Yeah. Um, just a, just a quick comment. I think it'd be important to know about these seven sites a little bit as far as the soils and maybe actually what the grower management was um, at some point in time. I don't know if that was a good time to do that, but I think you need to characterize those aspects for us to get a better understanding of that's, the data. That's the one thing that I'm working on this time, Dr. Uh, Hardy, is getting all of the production information as well as I can do uh, uh, a more detailed uh, determination of what the soil types. Yeah. Okay. At least okay. it, we're right where that sampling was taken at. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think where you took the soil sample to in relation to, you know, the, the row and where the plant is is important too. Did so, you take, did, you take, did you take the soil from in the drill where the plant is in the root system, or did you randomly sample um, the area, or, or, you know, in between rows, inner rows, and so forth. That's important too, especially interpreting the day. I, I will tell you this: I did. I've been taking them all in the row. In fact, I talked with Dr. Gattaboni after the first one. I was seeing pH values that was much lower than what I was would be expecting. I mean, 
in the low fives, mid fives. And I said, Dr. Gattaboni, and he sort of agreed that maybe it was where, you know, nitrogen was driving it down, you know, maybe from the starters or whatever. So in my, um, in my B10 sample, I took it as I had been right in the seed fur area, but then I took one in the middle. And Dr. Gattaboni, what did we see on those? I mean, what was basically no differences. I mean, the values look very similar as far as pH, but I did see lower values than what I was expecting. Now, I would think a lot of those growers would said, I can't believe my, my pH is that low, you know. So, so Dr. Heinegger, uh, I'll let you jump on next. I've got it so you should be able to share. Yeah, well, one question, Al, before I start. What were, the, you knew a little bit about what the soil type was. What were some of the range of soil types represented by these samples? Okay, the, I do know that there was one site that was, I would say there was two of them that were outliers. The one of them is more on a sandy soil, maybe even something like a, a state soil, a, more like a sandy loam. Uh, and then majority of them were like, silt loams but then i had one, another location uh in fact it was the p6 that one was a organic soil so i didn't and, and that was one of the reasons i wanted to do it with a range of different growers was to try to get a range of different soil types as well as management practices yep that but you're uh Dr. Hardy's exactly right, getting the uh, conditions because you are developing a baseline from which to compare. So it'll be important to compare the conditions, uh, the initial conditions as well. All right, let me see if I can share my screen here. Did it, uh, that's not how it does. There we go. Let's share. Let's go here. Share this. All right. Are you seeing that? Yes. Good. Good. Okay. Let me let me go to presentation mode if I can. Ah, uh, go backwards. I didn't want to go this far. Yeah. All right. Well, if everybody could hear me and see my screen, you don't want to see me for sure. See my screen? Why? I think we're in pretty good shape here. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to answer all the questions that Al had me answering as far as bandage and corn use and the tissue guide. But hopefully, I will give you some ideas of uh, what kind of baselines we're looking for, because that's really the issue here, is we're making a comparison uh, when we look at tissue sampling. We're comparing uh, what we, a standard, so to speak, against what we're testing or what the sample says for you. So it's important to understand some of the conditions of that um, uh, baseline, and that's what Dr. Hardy's saying, is that we need to, to look at these conditions. So, tissue testing, let's find some knowledge behind the numbers. That's always the question I get. What does this mean? What, what in the world does this 3%, 2.8, is that too low, too high? Should I be higher? Does, if I get it higher, does my yield increase? You, you've heard all these questions around tissue testing or tissue numbers. So let's take a little bit of a look at trying to find knowledge in these numbers here. So what is the tissue? And you're going to hear this, I'm sure, over and over here today. And hopefully that's right, because we've got to drive this home uh, in a way that you understand what tissue sampling really means. What does tissue test measure? It measures the concentration of an element in the tissue of the sample that was submitted. And it's reported as a percent by weight or in parts per million, which was really another way of <laughs> reporting percent, only in numbers that make, uh, are large enough to make sense there. So it's a concentration of the element in the sample. That's all it is. And whatever sample you sent, it's how much percent of that sample is nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or parts per million boron. That's what this tissue sample measure. It, it does not measure the total amount of a nutrient in a plant. It does not, unless I know the biomass of that plant, I cannot, and have a tissue sample that represents the plant, I cannot tell you the total nutrient uptake of that plant, which is really the most important piece of information we'd like to have, but it's hard to get, isn't it? You can't set biomass every time. 
So a tissue sample is a snapshot of this toe. That's what we're taking is a snapshot of a total nutrient content in a plant and trying to make sense of that snapshot. We may not see the whole elephant. We may see the toenail or the ear or something. We know what we're trying to use that to understand what that elephant looks like. It does not measure deficiency or excess. It does not. It does not measure deficiency or excess. So low numbers sometimes don't mean that you're low. High numbers don't mean that you are too high. It just means it just gives us an idea of, uh, of those relative values. So why is this? What is it that, that uh, we need to understand behind the tissue sample that helps us understand the larger picture here? Well, we need to look at factors that in. Al touched on a number of these already, and again, probably hear these again, which again is, is exactly right. Growth stage. You notice that Al's sufficiency changed by growth stage. Growth stage of when the sample is taken is important because it, it really reflects the size of the plant, it reflects the function of the plant, uh, the tissues that are functioning in the plant. It reflects how that root system is functioning. Growth stage is important and influences tissue concentration. The tissue sample. If I sample the stalk of a corn plant, if I took all the ears off and sampled the stalk, the tissue concentration would be slightly different than if I sampled the, the leaf. Similar to that ear, if I took the, just the ear, crushed it up and sampled it for nutrient, it would be different than, than the, the, uh, certainly than the leaves and certainly than the stalk. Where? What leaf was sampled? This is particularly true for these mobile elements, nitrogen, um, magnesium. These are, for those elements, if you sample the lower leaves, they're moving nutrients from that leaf to newer leaves. So it's going to be a different number in concentration than the upper leaves. The size of the plant. This, in my opinion, is one of the most important factors that influence tissue concentrations. How big the plant, Al mentioned this, that as the plants got bigger, the amount of concentration went down. Why is that? Well, it diluted it diluted the nutrient that was in the plant as more tissue was produced. Environment has an impact. Light, we get bright sunny days, you'll see more nitrogen concentrated in the leaves. Why? Because more chlorophyll is being made. If we get stress, water stress, uptake, anything that affects, and that's number six, anything that affects the uptake of the root system, tissue concentrations will go down. So these are all elements that influence the tissue concentrate and are important to understand. Now, let me, let me drive right at an issue that I'm sure many of you have heard or understood. And this is a story that Randy Dowdy often tells and it's often amusing to me, but not very helpful. Randy Dowdy tells a story about how he was trying to get you know, 400, 500 bushel corn yields or these record soybean yields. So he took a tissue sample, sent it off to his lab in Georgia, and it came back with a, a number. Uh, and he then called the lab guy and says, well, how much concentration do I need to get 400 bushel corn? What's this concentration? What's it equal as far as yield? To uh, 3% concentration at B7, is that equal 200 bushel corn or 300 bushel corn? If I get 5%, will that equal 500 bushel corn? This is, and he's, he's used this story over and over again and oftentimes ask it in meetings and, and things like that. So it does tissue, the question then is big, does tissue samples have a relationship to crop yield that do higher concentrations lead to greater yield? Yes and no. It just depends. It depends on the conditions at which you're sampling, the understanding of, of the baseline or the relationship between that baseline condition and where you're trying to go. In general, in general, if everything else is held equal, in other words, if, 
if nothing else, you've got a great environment, the sun is the same, the plant size is the same, you're sampling at the same growth stage, everything is the same, and you took one field and the next field, generally the higher concentrations of flower in a grade bill usually associate with greater yield. So indeed, if I'm wanting a 500 bushel corn crop, generally, if I'm taking it at tassel time instead of a sufficiency of 3% or 2.8%, I would like it at 3 or 3.5. If that's all that's limiting me is nutrients to get into that 500 bushels. But, small, but that's not usually the case. Small plants have higher concentrations, but low yield. Here's a good illustration that I often, you got to know your condition. There's a good illustration that I often use. I take a tissue sample at V7 from two fields. One visibly is yellow and has a, say, a tissue concentration of 2%. One visibly is bright green. It's got a tissue concentration of, let's say, 3.5% or 4 And I, so I'm thinking, man, that 3.5% or 4 I'm going to get so much better yield. At, har at uh, tassel time, the field that had the 3.5 or 4% gets stressed. The rainfall quits. But the other field does not. It pollinates. So in the end, my tissue concentration at 2% out yielded my tissue concentration at 3.5. This is So tissue concentrations are, again, a snapshot of the total picture. If you know your total picture or know uh, something about the picture, why well, you'll know the tissue concentrations, where they need to be to achieve the yield goal you have. There's been some studies done here uh, recently trying to look at conditions where we have four or 500 bushel yield potential. In other words, the right moisture, the right temperature, the right sunlight, and then seeing what tissue concentration might equate to that. But in, indeed, it's not a very good way of determining how much nutrient you need to apply here. All right, why is this? Whoa, 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 back, back, back. There we go. This is a, a chart out of the Southeastern uh, Guide on Tissue and Soil Sampling. And it basically shows the, uh, uh, is illustrates this issue between nutrient concentration in the tissue and crop yield. There's a deficiency range. There's an optimum yield and an optimum concentration. In general, as optimum yield increases, optimum concentration ought to slide to the right slightly. But generally, limitations to yield are often driven by other things other than nutrients, and therefore the optimum yield and optimum concentration are driven by the condition that that field has there. So this is just, this is just a good illustration of how uh, uh, sufficiency indexes or ranges are, are uh, identified here. And again, I'm sure you'll hear more about this. All right, let's just talk a little bit about corn. That's what Alice asked me to speak about. And uh, so let's take a look at this. Um, I'm just going to go over some of the things that Al already talked about. There are several different levels of sufficiency as we go along. Here's seedling. That, again, this is from that Southeastern uh, guide here. Their sufficiency uh, yeah, for uh, seedlings, anything less than four inches in height. I don't know whether V5 qualifies as less than four inches in height, but you can see these the numbers are quite high, four to five percent nitrogen, 0.4 to 0.6 percent uh, phosphorus, um, uh, uh, potassium, three to four percent. Now, once we get into early growth, just as Al showed, these numbers the sufficiency levels decline. It's three to four percent for nitrogen, 0.3 to 0.5 for phosphorus, and two to three percent. And you guys could read the rest of them. I'm not going to go through every one of them. I just want to make the point that it, that these change over time here, and you could see to understand a little bit of why at at less than four inches, most of the nutrients this plant is receiving are coming from the seed. That seed is rich in nutrients. So we would expect that small plant, not a lot of biomass, 
growing conditions are generally favorable or at least the positive, this plant should have a lot of uptake nutrient in those leaves to be sufficient. In other words, to reflect a good growth of a, of a normal growing seedling plant. Once we get the early growth, four inches to height, to tasseling, we're diluting, aren't we? We're diluting nutrients. This plant is now growing rapidly. That's diluting those nutrients out to these tissues so that nutrient sufficiency goes down, even though we're getting a bigger plant. With the, we, we see that those nutrients are sufficient to produce a normal growing crop or a, a decent yield, a, re a reasonable, optimal yield under these conditions here. Then, it, as Al pointed out, it, I have this going up a little bit, but actually, if you compare the bottom of this, uh, so just take in here, it's three to four percent. Now it's 2.8 to four percent here. Generally, you're, you're wanting your nutrients at tassel time to reflect your potential yield here. They, this is the first real indication where nutrient concentration should have some relationship to yield. So even though the, the bottom end of the scale is going down, I generally think that I want to hold those nutrient concentrations as, as high as I can in this tassel period here. And then finally, there's maturity. And you can see here at maturity, uh, 2.5 to 3.5%. This is uh, probably the, the time in which I think we have the most likely relationship between actual just concentration and yield. Um, generally, if you say if at R5, you're taking a tissue sample uh, at R5, we don't do that very often, but I would guess that that tissue set, the, the old rule of thumb, that's not all that old, but a rule of thumb is your tissue concentration times uh, 100, I think that's right, yeah, times 100 will equal yield. For instance, 3.5% times 100 would be 350 bushel. 2.5% times 100 would be 250 bushel, potential, potential. That's just a rule of thumb uh, that um, reflects the, the best time to reflect the tissue concentrations and yield. All right. So let's uh, look at how this translates into some of the data that we collected in North Carolina over time here. And that's just, again, if you look at these two charts and look at the bottom here, you notice I'm not, don't have nitrogen tissue concentration, do I? I've got nitrogen uptake. So I'm measuring both the tissue concentration. What I'm doing is I took a cut the whole plant off at the soil level, ground it all up. We took a tissue sample of that ground biomass, and then we measured the biomass, and we could then calculate nitrogen uptake. I'm just I'm just showing how how when we know both biomass and tissue concentration, why how we can see that relationship to yield here. So if you look at at uh, lay by B7, if you will, here you can see there's a scattering all over the place. The R squared I, I put a um, a, a, a function there, a, an exponential or a rising function. I think it's actually a quadratic function there. Use the quadratic function to try to fit that data, and it did okay, but there's, it's not a significant relationship there. We got so much scatter. So in, in essence, you might say, yeah, a little higher nitrogen concentration there. In other words, if I knew you know, all my plants are the same size from two fields, a little higher nitrogen concentration might have made some increase in yield. But there's a lot of scatter uh, unknown in that uh, data there. As I get then to VT here, or just prior to VT, if I know nitrogen uptake at VT, that uh, that quadratic function fits that data almost, uh, that's a really good relationship there. So I have a pretty daggone good understanding then of what my yield potential is. Again, this is uptake, total nitrogen uptake. There we're reflecting how much nutrient we have in the, in the total plant here, we can predict yield. Now, how does this relate to tissue concentration? Well, if if my plant sizes are the same, my environment is the same, 
therefore tissue concentration is the only variable that is therefore higher tissue concentrations would lead to higher yields. I have to have the base, don't I? I have to have plant size. I have to have good environment. Then tissue concentration is my next feature that I think about. So Randy Dowdy, in a way, is right. He created the ideal environment. So therefore, indeed, tissue concentration is a concern for him. But for many of us, we don't have that kind of environment. So we tissue concentration means less to us about uh, yield or increase in tissue concentration means less to us as far as increase in yield. We need to focus on plant size and other things, tissue and just maintaining tissue concentrations above the sufficiency level. All right, let me show you some data here. Uh, it sort of reflects some of this data that Al has already uh, presented, and Al's exactly right. What he's attempted to do here is he's attempting to establish these baselines, isn't he? So that they can see if it's the same soil type, if, it's a, if the environment, this is actually a good year to do this because this is a, a pretty good environmental year. So this should establish how much tissue concentration we need in a good growing environment with decent sized plants under these soil conditions. Then we know if we can increase tissue concentration from that number, we should increase yield under similar conditions. Or if we have lower tissue concentrations and a poor year, we know that that year, it's an environmental impact on that uh, concentration. Anyway, he's establishing this baseline. And I think that's a very useful thing for us to consider. All right, here's what I've done here is uh, we were looking at, we're gonna look at three different soil types here. We're, lo we're looking at the sandy loam over at the peanut belt research station at Lewiston. We did the same thing Al did. We took tissue samples at, at numerous times. Now you notice my bottom axis is growing degree days. I did, I'm not gonna report them by, uh, by growth stage here. I'm gonna report them by how many growing degree days had occurred. That's a, a better idea of where that plant development was uh, along the year. And then I'm going to put a leaf area index uh, curve here. So it shows you basically at, at maximum leaf area, you're talking about VT, aren't you? That's when the last leaf emerges. So we're right after that maximum leaf area there in that curve. And it starts down while we've reached VT and now are in reproductive. So that gives you some idea of what that uh, growth stage of these plants were. And then I've got the sufficiency uh, index lower sufficiency index numbers uh, listed here by red line. So you can see they decline uh, just like I showed you from the Southern uh, uh, report there. All right, so you can see I have two conditions. In one condition, I didn't do any micronutrient, didn't add any boron, uh, if that should be zinc. <laughs> I don't know what AN is, but it's not zinc. AN is zinc and magnesium. So I added some micronutrients and then I didn't. So you can see nitrogen did similar to what Al showed you. It declined as the plant is in that rapid growth stage from V7 to VT, nitrogen concentration in the tissue is declining. Then at, at tassel time, why uh, it, it started to pick back up. The plant now is at a static point. The root system obviously is functioning here. We probably had some rainfall we picked up some nitrogen so that tissue concentration rose back up. You can see the baseline with no micronutrients is lower than where we added some micronutrients here, which I uh, attribute to differences in, in root function or nutrient uptake uh, function of the roots here. So that's tissue nitrogen. Here's tissue phosphorus from the same samples again i've got the base uh sufficiency base and you can see in both of the uh, uh nutrient the tissue uh, sufficiency here uh, in this case the phosphorus is sort of level in one a little higher at that planting time in the other so how did that relate to yield well you can see there at the right hand side i have no micros at planting and the blue bars are no micros at lay so that's your your uh, checks so v3 and v6 i have two checks there if you pay, it didn't make any difference. If I put micros that lay by, it was too late to influence the, the root system. 
if I put them on a planting time, you could see we did get some significant increase. So indeed, under equal conditions, a little bit higher tissue concentration in nitrogen, it did not affect phosphorus significant, and nitrogen did increase our yield slightly. Let's take a look at an organic soil. Similar situation here. Again, nitrogen is declining as we get toward VT and then stable. Uh, stable. In this case, there was no difference in, in those uh, micronutrients uh, there in tissue concentration for nitrogen. If we look at phosphorus, we see the same situation. The, the tissue co concentrations are declining slightly here. Generally, phosphorus in both cases at the sandy soil or here over time tended, once you established your phosphorus uptake or concentration, it tended to, to remain somewhat stable and above sufficiency levels here. And then here's potassium. I didn't have potassium for a peanut belt. Uh, I had it. I just didn't, couldn't find my, my graph. But at any rate, you can see here, we made a little difference in potassium, but just as Al showed you, potassium is declining. You're pulling all that potassium out of the soil here. Potassium uptake uh, 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 tends to decline. Surprisingly here, we did get an impact from the boron or that micronutrient application, probably in this case because of this potassium, slight potassium advantage here that we had. So again, Tissue concentrations can influence yield, and we can influence a tissue concentration in the plant. Finally, let's look at the uh, uh, clay loam soil here in the Piedmont. Here's tissue concentration of nitrogen here. Slight differences, efficiency indexes for that nutrient. Here's where it gets interesting. Here we have uh, phosphorus. Again, not much change in phosphorus over time, but there is some advantage where we put these micronutrients on a little higher phosphorus index. We were below sufficiency at phosphorus at this site. And then here's potassium. Potassium, if you <laughs> look at the decline, fit the sufficiency, uh, you know, that bottom level of sufficiency very well. But we did have some increase in potassium uptake where we use the micronutrients. So what would you guess would be the yield results? Wherever we use micronutrients to try to influence the root mass, we increase the yield here uh, significantly. So again, that far blue bar, no micros at planting and no lay by that check. So you can see the results, what, what we saw in patterns and three different soils, this was in the same year, Three different soils, uh, the three different locations. Yeah, we, if we can achieve a little higher nutrient concentration under similar conditions of plant size, why indeed we can, we can influence yield a little bit. So just to talk a little bit about these trends on sandy organic soils, generally nitrogen declines. And you saw that in Al's data. We're, diff we're uh, as the plant grows, we're diffusing or, or reducing the concentration because of uh, plant size. So it's uh, these plant nitrogen numbers are typically going to decline slightly. You saw that whether I use micronutrients or not, that pattern holds true. Phosphorus concentration is determined early. That's our experience with phosphorus tissue concentrations. Once they're established, it's awfully hard to move them. That you could add phosphorus, you could do whatever you want, but it's hard to move phosphorus. It's, it's established early, and I think it's got something to do with early root establishment as the phosphorus concentrations. Potassium, in most cases, declines over time, again, because we're pulling it out of the soil, a lot of potassium needed in, in a corn crop here. It is totally, finally, probably the most important point I want to make. It's total nutrient uptake that's important. If increasing concentration leads to increases in total nutrient uptake by soaking or flowering, then yield will increase. In other words, the same size of plant, the same environment, we increase nutrient concentrations, we can increase yield. But keep in mind, 
from one year to the next, your plant size is different. Your uptake is different. So you've got to establish a baseline based on that client. So Dr. Hardy's comments are right on target. We got to establish these baselines based on the conditions, and that forms the foundation for understanding whether increasing nutrient concentrations in the tissue will help us uh, increase yield. Are there any questions here? I, that's what I had here. I'm going to stop my share, get back to reality here, and uh, see if anybody uh, got any questions. Dr. Heineken, Mitch Smith here. The, you mentioned a, a, a th uh, uh, maybe a formula you used early on, uh, not too old, tissue percentage times 100 was that at VT? You said no, no. That's at and that's actually at R five. Okay, it, it's, it it would be late flowering when that that the samples I've taken at late flowering or a late flowering late uh, 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 grain fill. Sorry, late grain fill. Let me get my <laughs> my name right here. Right, uh, late grain fill have some pot uh, relationship. The higher the tissue concentration at late grain fill has some re the relationship that that's the only place where I see Hardy or or uh, Hula. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, Hula or uh, 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 what's his face having any Dowdy had Dowdy Dowdy not Hardy Dowdy Dowdy and Hula. Boy, I've been on vacation too long. Dowdy <laughs> or Hula have any real relationship to to tissue countries at late grain fill. And in their data, you can see that if they can achieve 5% tissue concentration, late grain fill, and that's hard to do, but they have done it. Why, that's where they, they can relate that to 500, 600 bushel grain yields. I've seen from our samples, if I get 2.8%, I get about 280. If I have a 1.7, I got about 107. That's about as close to where tissue concentration and yield have a, a clear relationship. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Heinegger. Yes. Um, maybe I should hold my question. Let me let, uh, if we can, let Dr. Uh, Hicks go ahead and share about tissue sample, but I do have a question I want to ask you, but we, let's go ahead and let her go. D Dr. Hicks? I'm here. Okay, you've got the floor. All right, I'm gonna get this to go full screen. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, we, uh, we've covered uh, some of this material already. Um, so I'm just gonna like be very brief um, in, uh, in reviewing tissue analysis because I think most of you are pretty familiar with it. Uh, but just to remind you, it's not a substitute for soil testing. Uh, they work best when you do them together, uh, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot a crop. Uh, one, of the, one of the advantages though is that uh, as has been pointed out, the soil test is not measuring nitrogen or boron. So the tissue tests are, are particularly useful for evaluating those two nutrients. And so as uh, Dr. Heinegger has pointed out, the tissue test is measuring the concentrations of nutrients in the plant leaves. And then when you measure them in the leaves, you compare that to an established sufficiency range in order to determine whether or not that's an adequate uh, level of, of uh, nutrient in that particular plant part at that particular growth stage. So just as a reminder on how to collect a tissue sample, it's very important to get the right plant part for the right growth stage because the sufficiency ranges are based on the combination of the plant part and the growth stage. So if you're um, collecting seedlings and that's defined as anything that's below 12 inches, so seedlings and early growth at less than a foot tall, you wanna take the whole plant uh, about an inch above the soil line. And I wanna just remind folks, like do get at least an inch above the soil line because you don't, if you get a lot of dirt in that sample, um, you're gonna end up, that's gonna affect your results because that's, we're gonna be measuring that on our instruments. So you'll, you'll come up with like very high micronutrient levels that have been picked up by contamination from that soil. So do, uh, do try to keep your samples from getting a lot of uh, soil on them when you're collecting them. 
Um, then after, uh, after that one foot tall stage, when it's still in early growth, what you're going to collect is the most recent mature leaf, uh, which is, you know, about the fifth leaf down. After that, when, once you get into uh, bloom and fruiting stages, you're going to collect the ear leaf. Now, a lot, of, a lot of folks misunderstand what the ear leaf is. I've seen uh, a number of people who are collecting the leaf that's right below the ear. That is actually not the ear leaf. Uh, surprisingly, it's actually opposite and uh, below where the ear is that is the actual ear leaf. So I've seen in, in, uh, in some publications that people are collecting the wrong part for this stage. So the ear leaf is not the leaf by the ear, if that makes any sense. Um, so like I said, the species ranges are based on the combination of the growth stage of the plant part. So it's really important that you report that correctly to the lab because that's going to determine what sufficiency range gets applied to your numbers. So for example, uh, you want to, for seedlings and uh, you always want to have whole or in early, you always want to have whole or the most recent mature leaf. At that early growth stage, if you collect the whole plant, but you don't tell us, then we're, probably, we're going to guess that you collected the most recent mature leaf and you're going to get the wrong sufficiency range for, for your sample. So it's very important that you tell us as accurately as possible, what growth stage was it at? and which plant part did you collect so that we can assign the right interpretation to your numbers. And just so you know, it's completely fine to report in V or R stages. We know what that means. So we'll, we'll assign the right code to it based on what you tell us. And we actually prefer it if you tell us the V and R stages, because then we can kind of get a feel of like how early is early. Is it early late or early early? So that helps us a lot in the interpretation. Um, so as, as Ron has pointed out, the sufficiency ranges change based on the growth stage. So here, is, uh, the, here are the numbers we, we use, and Ron has, sh has shown this already. But what you can see here is that here, here's the nitrogen. You can see that as that crop is progressing, the target nitrogen concentration in that plant part is dropping. And you see the same thing for P and for K. Now your other nutrients, the, the ranges don't change based on the growth stage. I think that some of them probably should, but uh, pretty, most labs just use one set of ranges for everything except NPK. Um, and you know, Ron has already pointed out that part of the reason that's happening is because that crop is growing really fast. And so those nutrients are being diluted in the tissue as, it's, as the biomass is increasing. And, but another reason that I'd like to point out is that NP and K are mobile in plant tissue. And so what that means practically is that the nutrients are moving out of the leaves and into other plant parts as the crop is maturing. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a moment, but I just wanted to quickly give you some statistics. Um, and this is just keep in mind that it's really important that you accurately report growth stages of plant parts to us because then we are able to report back to you uh, on what we are seeing in terms of trends in plant tissue data for North Carolina. So what we have here is the percent of corn samples that were submitted to the NCDA lab between 2010 and 2021. So this is 11 years worth of data on a grower sample submitted to us uh, for corn. And then what we've done here is broken it out by the growth stage and then calculated the percent of each of all of those samples that were low or deficient in a particular nutrient. So you can see some, some definite trends here. Uh, if you look at phosphorus, for example, we see a lot of low phosphorus in seedlings in early growth stage in corn. And that's not necessarily because we have a phosphorus deficiency in our soils. In fact, we, we tend to have too much phosphorus in our soils. So I want to, we'll, I want to talk about that when we get to some example reports about why, why that's happening. Um, so I think it's important to understand not just what the tissue test uh, means in terms of what the crop needs, but also in terms of what it doesn't need, because just you, you look at this number and that might seem alarming to you, right? 44% of seedlings submitted were low in phosphorus. Uh, that might make you think that, oh, we have a, a, a big fertility problem, but we don't because once again, the, the soil 
test is telling you what's in the soil. The tissue test is telling you what the plant is actually taking up. And so there are a lot of things that are affecting uptake of nutrients other than soil fertility. Um, one, and one of those things is, is this mobility issue that, we, what, that I've mentioned previously. So some, some good things to know are that in corn, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and zinc are mobile to moderately mobile in the corn leaf. Um, and so what that means is that as the crop is progressing, the nutrients are moving out of the mature leaves and into the younger leaves or into the grain or, or even into the stalk. But they're, they're translocating. So when we say translocating, we're just saying it's moving. So the nutrients are moving out. So what, we sh what we're seeing here, this was 4,000 samples um, from 2013 to 2017 that I looked at. And I broke out the nitrogen, which is in the light blue, and then the potassium, which is in the purple, and then measured that in the tissue uh, by the different growth stages. So you can see the nitrogen here is dropping as the crops are progressing. So this is not just a handful of samples. This is 4,000 samples collected in North Carolina over a four-year period. So you can see a very strong trend in this direction that, that that is dropping. And that's dropping because of the dilution effect that Ron talked about. It's also dropping because nitrogen is mobile in the tissue. And so to a degree, this is a very natural process. Uh, the, the plant is maturing and it's, it's, it's reallocating the nutrients in the leaves to the grain. Uh, you see the same trend with potassium dropping slowly as the crop is maturing. And what these red bars are, are the sufficiency ranges. Um, so they look like they, they capture that, that information pretty well. Um, and so the sufficiency ranges account for this for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They don't really account for this for sulfur or zinc. We just have one set of ranges for sulfur and zinc, and we'll see what that looks like in this next slide. So this is phosphorus and sulfur up here on the right. So here's phosphorus in green. And you can see that the phosphorus is dropping as the crops are maturing. And then that red bar is at the sufficiency range, which is also dropping to reflect that uh, natural process. Uh, sulfur, however, you see sulfur is also dropping, but the sulfur range doesn't really change. You see the same thing for zinc. Zinc is dropping in the tissue in the leaf tissue as the crop is maturing. And that, that, that zinc is, is not, is moving to other parts of the corn. So it's moving into the stalks, it's moving into the grain, it's moving to where it needs to be in the plant. Um, but the sufficiency range that we use does not necessarily capture that really well. And so one of the side effects of that is that we see a lot of low zinc in corn uh, after that bloom stage. And my suspicion is that it's not so much that we have a, a problem with, well, we don't have inadequate zinc in our soils. Um, my suspicion is that the sufficiency range is actually set too high and that we should really be dropping our sufficiency range for zinc at the bloom, fruit, and mature stages. Um, so we don't have a, a we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to move on to some example reports. And I'd really like this to be an, an open discussion. Uh, with our, our panel and like anybody who wants to just chime in and, and make comments or ask questions. But I, I pulled up some example reports that I, that I shared with Luke and Al and David and Ron uh, beforehand, just to kind of, we, we had talked about this and talked about how we wanted to show some examples of uh, when it was for a fertility issue and when it was not a fertility issue. Because it's just as important to know when, when uh, the low tissue nitrogen is not because of fertility. So this is a, a classic example that we see uh, just all the time. I mentioned how we had that 44% of seedling and early corn plants coming up low in phosphorus. We see that we see that all the time. So here's an example report from Hyde County a couple of years back. Very low phosphorus in the plant tissue, but then in the corresponding soil report, it had tons of phosphorus. So it, it wasn't a fertility issue; it was an uptake issue. And it was, it, <laughs> and David's whispering in my ear, and it was probably an organic soil. <laughs> it, is, it is organic soil. Yes. Okay, and it is an organic soil. Come, come on in, David. Okay. Um, so, Dr. So, Hicks, could you uh, explain a little bit about um, 
the manner in which phosphorus has relation to some of the other nutrients and how it relates to what you're talking about here. Whether well, I don't, so, we don't know from yeah, the report yeah. if it was cold. Yeah, cold. yeah. So what phosphorus is uh, moves more slowly in soil than other nutrients do. It moves by diffusion, and so uh, it's very sensitive to environmental conditions. So if the soil is too cold, if it's too wet then um, the uptake is going to be slow for the plant. And so really what that means is that the soil just needs to warm up. And that's what we tend to re uh, recommend when we see these phosphorus levels is that uh, these are likely environmental conditions and that they'll likely improve once that once the soil warms up a bit. David, do you want to comment on the organic soil? Well, just, here? Just, just notice an organic soil with a pH uh, target is 5 and got a pH here of 4.9. This isn't a low pH situation that's affecting phosphorus uptake or root growth. Just want people to notice that if they didn't already. High County, a lot of organic soils. Okay, so this, this, this is an example of something where, you know, it, the uh, tissue report might suggest that you have a fertility problem, but it's, it's actually an environmental problem uh, that, that's affecting that. And so with these, we tend to just recommend that people uh, give the crop some time give the soil some time to warm up and, and the crop some time to start improving that uptake. Um, this, on the other hand, is an example of a, a fertility issue. So you can kind of see the difference here. You've got deficient magnesium in the tissue. This is at early growth. Uh, and we do see a lot of low magnesium in the tissue at early growth stages. But if you look at the corresponding soil report, that pH is too low. Uh, David, I believe that's 6.0 is the target. Well, th this is an organic soil too. Um, and yeah, it's, and this pH compared to the pH on the previous report for these soils, once we hit about 4.5 and below, we can have, you know, soil acidity could have problems. So this is truly organic soil with a fertility problem being low pH and fairly low base saturation. Look at the base saturation of 38%. Typically for an organic soil that's at target, we will see about at least 50% base saturation. Mm -hmm. And so that's affecting the percent of magnesium that's uh, occupying those CEC exchange sites. So the amount of actual magnesium available to the plant is, is low. And you'll see a magnesium recommendation there too. Yep. If you look right there, the soil report has recommended in addition to, um, did it recommend, uh, in addition yes. to a lime recommendation, it also recommended specifically magnesium. So here is a, the opposite situation where you have low magnesium in the tissue, but it does not appear to be a related to um, soil fertility. So this was from New Hanover County. County. These are all in early growth stages. We do see a lot of low, low magnesium in the tissue at early growth stages. And um, occasionally that's a, a, an actual fertility problem, but more often than not at these early spring, in early spring, it's an uptake problem because of um, just because of the soil conditions, or it might be if, you know, if this corn plant is at like B10, it might be because that plant is growing so fast that it's diluting the magnesium in the tissue. So we see that a lot with magnesium where it's, it's not a fertility problem. You can look down here at the soil report, the pH is fine. The amount of magnesium available is fine. There is no magnesium recommendation. There's no lime recommendation. So when we see those together, that, that tells us that that's an uptake problem. Either the plant's growing really fast or the soil conditions are, uh, you know, are not ideal. And Dr. Heath, uh, one thing that I learned was that there's no sufficiency value for either magnesium nor calcium. Is that correct? At least in the tissue? The, yeah, there's sufficiency values. There are? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they, they don't change by growth stage. Okay. So there's there's one rent there's one target range for yes there all, is okay all, all I'm saying there's not a set amount maybe it's in the soil there's no set amount is that true? There, in the soil we have no set amount for calcium. That's it. That's we have no set amount for calcium. We do for magnesium. Calcium. And, yeah, for calcium there is, but for there is not for calcium, but there is for magnesium. There is a set critical level. Gotcha. 
Dr. Hicks, I have a question. Is it because um, K is excessive in the tissue? Um, probably not. Uh, we, we see the K effects occasionally, but that K would have to be a lot higher than 5% before we would start seeing that. If the K was, you know, nudging up towards 8%, then we, that would flag to us that, that, that that's, that's much too high and you could start to see interactions between K and calcium and K and, and magnesium. Um, but, you know, it would really need to be higher than 5% before that, that would take place. Thank you. Uh, so this is an example. That, uh, here I'm not showing any soil data. These are both tissue reports. One's from Iredale and one's from Pamlico. Um, and what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is a, a, a discussion that I think is important to have about boron uh, because boron is, is not really mobile in corn. And so uh, its primary uptake is going to be through the root system. And so once it gets to where it, the, uh, the plant is depositing it, that's where it stays. And boron is, is very, very critical for good kernel development. Um, it needs to be, you need to have adequate boron in the, in the actual tassel. That's where it needs to be. It needs to be in the actual tassel before uh, that uh, starts, it starts to turn into grain uh, in order to make that, uh, in order to have like a good kernel uh, size and plumpness and uh, formation. So when you see those, those disfigured corn e ears, sometimes that can be, uh, that can tell you that you have a boron issue. But the, the problem with that is like, once you're already at milk stage, applying boron is not going to help you much because it, it really needed to be there early on in the season, at, at least by flowering. Um, and that, so that really drives whether or not we're gonna make a recommendation. So in this particular example, these boron levels are the same in these corn plants. Um, but in this one, it's at early stage. In that one, we're going we're gonna to recommend that some boron be applied to the soil because that crop still has the opportunity to take that boron up and get it into those tassels before that seed starts to set. Down here in this fruiting stage, if it's, you know, much past R2, then we're not going to recommend boron um, because it's just, you know, it's not going to get into, not be able to get up into the plant in time in order to make any difference because those, those kernels have already developed. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is like with boron, it's really important to get it adequate in the tissue before you get into those fruiting stages. And then this is my last slide and I'm happy to, um, if anybody wants to talk, go back or talk about any of these, we can. Um, this is an example of something very important that a lot of folks don't think about, I think they're, it's not on people's radar and that's the nitrogen to sulfur ratio. Because what happens there is if you have a really high nitrogen to sulfur ratio, even if you have adequate sulfur, you can see sulfur deficiencies showing up in the plant, because specifically because of that ratio. So what we've got here up at the top is uh, matching. This is all the same grower. So he sent in a plant report from a good set and a, soil, a corresponding soil report from that tissue test. And then he sent in a, a bad set. So you got your, your good plant here and your good soil here, and then your bad plant here and your bad soil here. And so what you can see, first of all, is in these soil reports, the sulfur index is the same. There's really no difference. Like the 35, 33, that's basically the same. And the soil report doesn't give a sulfur recommendation until it gets below an index of 25. But what you can see that's different here is the nitrogen sulfur ratios are very different. Um, in this good sample, it's 17 to 1. That's still a little higher than we like to see in corn. For most crops, it's, we flag it at 18. But for, crop, for corn, we really like it to be more like 14, 16. But look, when you get down here, that's a 32 to 1 nitrogen sulfur ratio. And so this crop was showing sulfur deficiency, even though there was enough sulfur in the soil and there was enough sulfur in the tissue. So in spite of those facts, it was still experiencing sulfur deficiency because of that NS ratio. And and Dr. Gets, Dr. Hicks, and the bi biology behind that is, is that both those um, elements are needed for protein uh, production. So you have mm -hmm. to have adequate amounts of both to, for, I reckon, for good protein production. Is that correct? 
Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, you have to have them, uh, both of them for protein production. You have to have them in the right ratios. And if that, those ratios are off, it affects the ability of the crop to uh, simulate both nitrogen and sulfur. And then what you can note here in this plant report is nitrogen is excessively high in the tissue. So that's one thing we can see is like when you put out a whole lot of nitrogen, you can start to see the crop yellow because that NS ratio has been uh, thrown out of balance. So that's something to be aware of that, um, to be cautious about when you're uh, putting out your additional nitrogen applications, because that's, that's an excessive amount of nitrogen in the tissue for that growth stage. And that's what's driving that high NS ratio. <coughs> but that nitrogen is not necessarily being incorporated. So you, you, you have all this high nitrogen in the tissue, but if the sulfur is not there in the right proportion to the nitrogen, then the plant is not utilizing that nitrogen in the tissue. It's not being, it's not being incorporated into organic nitrogen forms, if what that makes any that, sense. What should that nitrogen sulfur ratio range be or what's the ideal? I like to see it around 14 to 16. Okay. I'm not going to be concerned about 17. I, really, you don't start to see it, see the effects until you get up into the 20s. Um, but we, we like to be conservative about it and to, and to keep it, you know, in the 14 to 16 range. Just so you don't, you're not getting anywhere near this where you're actually seeing a crop response, a negative crop impact from that high NS ratio. And we see this in wheat as well. Wheat and corn are both very sensitive. All your grains are very sensitive to the nitrogen sulfur ratio. Um, and they'll turn yellow in a heartbeat if you get that, that nitrogen sulfur ratio out of whack. So what do you do when that happens? You apply more sulfur? Um, yeah, yeah. In that situation, we would recommend uh, a sulfur application in order to restore the balance, even though you have enough sulfur. And, you know, the sulfur in the soil, that's, it's on the low end. It's not technically deficient, but it's getting, getting on the low end. David, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah we, we didn't um, many years ago make a sulfur recommendation, but we thought we, we have it now as far as the level we report. And it is on the lower end of things. And I would say the sulfur index in soil is not as diagnostic or as representative of, of possibly a plant needing sulfur as plant tissue testing would give. So it, it's there as a guide. It's not, um, it's not as specific as like potassium is or phosphorus is as far as interpretation standpoint. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is if you get um, yellowing because of high excessive nitrogen, you apply more, ni uh, more sulfur. Is that right? That's right. Thank you. I've often heard nitrogen and sulfur referred to as companion nutrients <sighs> because they, they do help each other as far as utilization. Mm -hmm. There is another factor. Uh, at, uh, if uh, we need to make sure that the, the tissue sampling and the soil sampling was at the same time, because maybe the uh, if this soil report is from uh, previous the planting, maybe you can uh, we could have some problem with uh, sulfur leaching, and so that uh, sulfur is lower than the the report is saying. That's true. Yeah, and that's a great point, Luke. Uh, the Sulfur is very prone to leaching. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's going to, you can think of it, you know, like with nitrogen and with potassium, if you're having a lot of leaching rains, then the sulfur is going to be impacted by that, just as the nitrogen and the potassium are. Dr. Gattaboni, could you also, when we were talking about this data yesterday, talk about the difference in availability of sulfur? the sulfur forms could you talk a minute about that oh uh, it, it was just a comment uh, that we, we are talking when uh, we depending on the the uh, uh, sulfur source that you are using for example if you are using sulfate uh, like uh, in gypsum or ammonium sulfate the ams uh, you have this sulfur uh, ready available for, for plants because it's, it's, the, it's the form that plants will take up. Uh, but, uh, for example, when you are using tile sulfate, we have 50% of the sulfur that is ready available because it's sulfate. But we have the other 
fifty uh, percent of the the the, the sulfur is uh, a sulfur that needs to be converted to sulfate before uh, to be used. And so, depending on the source, we have this ready available source, or maybe uh, depending on the source, you need to have this uh, oxidation of sulfur before plant can use it. And in the ammonium thiosulfate, in, in thiosulfate, uh, we have 50% available with 50% need to be oxidized before uh, to be available. Um, is that the Heinegger still? Yeah, he's here. Yeah, I'm still here. Dr. Heinegger, one of the questions that I've had posed to me, well, let me back up. I, I'm finding out that I'm getting an increasing number of growers that are actually aerially applying because they can't get across the corn. They're putting on yeah. nitrogen at VT or say a couple of weeks prior to VT. I also had a grower the other day that was looking at putting it on. His corn was probably at R1 and, uh, and I told him, I said, I'm not certain about the safety or whatever you want to use. I said, wait till the silks dry, but what is the what would you see say would be the latest that you think putting on nitrogen would be beneficial because there are a lot more growers now that are doing that and so that's one of the things that i'm getting questions about well yeah uh, it depends uh, a little bit. you know first of all let's talk a little bit about the nitrogen uptake curve by VT, about 65% of the nitrogen has already been taken in by the plant. So you're talking about 30, uh, 25%, something like that. It needs to, to still be taken up. So there's a, a chance that you can uh, increase yield if that plant requires more nitrogen, that you could apply it VT and do a decent job of, of getting it into the plant and uh, impacting yield at that stage. So we've done some work on this where we looked at, at spreading out nitrogen applications. And what we found was that, yeah, 50 units of VT, we were able to increase yield by spreading uh, nitrogen at, at a third application, uh, planting lay by and VT, we could increase uh, yield and that we were able to, uh, the idea is to maintain nitrogen uptake through R5 so that you can uh, meet that late need for nitrogen of the crop. That's the idea of applying uh, some late nitrogen. Now, there, I mean, technically you could apply nitrogen all the way to R5. The problem there is uptake. Uh, you're not going to get much nitrogen through the leaf itself. So that means you have to get it on the ground. It has to diffuse into the soil, get in the roots and into the plant. If you're waiting until the R5 to apply it, you're virtually assured that it's not going to get into the plant. It's going to be on the soil or someplace in that process. So, so waiting that late, it's an uptake issue. Uh, VT, I think you could probably make some argument that you can uh, put a little bit even as late as blister stage and get R2 and get uh, some meaningful movement of, of uh, yield if nitrogen is required and limiting to, to yield in that uh, situation. So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's a hard answer. It, it all depends. Is nitrogen their limiting factor? How much uh, more do you have in the soil that up is going to be meet that 25-30% need for uptake? Um, and are you able to, if you're going to apply some, are you able to get it to the root and into the plant? Those are things that would have to be considered in making light applications of nitrogen. Um, and seeing whether they're economical. The reason I think many guys are asking this year is that crop, uh, we had a great early growth period in that crop. Uh, then of course it turned dry and then rainfall came. So everybody's thinking, well, did I get enough nitrogen on to meet the need for this crop? Did I get uh, uh, enough root mass for uptake? 
Uh, so that's why the question, and that really should be based upon some analysis of tissue concentration of what, how much nitrogen you've already applied. And um, that, that would help us determine whether or not they should apply any more. So what I've got for you all, the speaker panel, but based on what's been shown today, is tissue sampling in conjunction with soil sampling, is this something that can help farmers to make better decisions? That's, that's my question. Yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> I will tell you this, you know, Dr. Heinegger was saying, you know, at, what was it, uh, Dr. Heinegger, you said, uh, what if your nitrogen is at, what did you say, R? R5. Is, is basically a reflection of yield potential. So, so you know, based on that, some some people might come to the conclusion. Well, I'll just take a tissue sample at R five. But right, what I'm too, it's too late to do it. I mean, why are you taking this sample? You're two reasons that we know of. You're doing either a predictive. That's what I've talked a lot about here today. I haven't talked about diagnostic samples. I've talked about predictive. You're trying to predict what your pattern is. The way we've outlined it here today is you see nitrogen declining. So what you're, if you're taking one early at B7, you want that tissue high enough that, that if it declines, you're still gonna be in the sufficiency range by the time you reach tassel time when we're really determining yield uh, uh, potential by filling grain and determining kernel number. So it's a prediction. You're trying to make a prediction and you're basing that on past history. That's where sufficiencies are determined. The Southeast, they determine sufficiency levels based on the yield potential of the soils and the crops, the, the environment of the Southeast. They determined how big the plants were. All of these things went into determine those sufficiency levels and they fit very well as we see here today in most cases. So, so that's what you're doing is you're using a tissue sample and predict it. Now, diagnostic is entirely different. Why do you take more than one diagnostic sample? You take a good and a bad. Why do you do that? So that you can determine what is going on. So you can compare the tissue concentrations as, as Kristen just pointed out, they could be due to soil. They could be due to how the crop is growing. They could be due to uptake. You're comparing your good and bad. That's why diagnostic sampling is so important to take a good and bad sample for that comparative reason. Yes, tissue samples almost are indispensable to us uh, in many ways. And if we learn to, to read our baselines, and that's what you're trying to establish for these growers is baseline. If we learn to read our baselines, why we can learn to say, well, I need a little bit more at B7 to be to make my baseline, or I need, I'm perfectly fine with 1.8% nitrogen. You know, it, 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 we have to establish in a predictive manner, a baseline to allow us to, to see how these predictive samples are gonna work in our situation. David, Randy Dowdy and David Hula need different baselines than us. That's because they got situations that are totally different from any of our uh, situations. So they need different baselines. So I'll just make this comment, Al, as far as related to what you kind of asked there. I think, uh, you know, in taking tissue and soil samples together, it's most needed in diagnostic situations for good and bad comparisons. I think for monitoring the crop during the growing season, I wouldn't necessarily take additional soil samples. I don't let tissue sampling be my guide. I think somebody needs to take excellent soil samples and follow the recommendations to make fertility decisions going into the production season and fertilizing the crop. But I would, I would not necessarily recommend taking soil samples and tissue samples to monitor the crop through the growing season. I well, think it could be misleading. I will tell you this. Initially, I was just going to take one at the beginning. Uh, Dr. Heiger suggested that, but I said, well, I'm going to take them for all of them. So, and, and I did seeing how those, the potassium, that was a real educational thing, seeing how those values drop. But uh, so we'll just have one sample. The first time we sampled, 
the teach sample being adequate, you think? I, what I'm saying is I would take a soil sample if I was a grower to establish my recommendations for the growing season. From that point forward in monitoring the crop, I would tissue sample through the season with growth stage. I would not take additional soil samples when I took those tissue samples because I think they could mis be misleading and a grower could misinterpret what's going on in the field. Yeah. Luke, Luke can further comment on that probably. Luke? Sorry, <laughs> I was answering another question. Yeah, Can you okay. repeat, uh, David? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So I, 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 I just have, go ahead. I have a question about the n is to s ratio. Um, so, what uh, source of sulfur would be good um, if the balance is off in a diagnostic, um, and till what stage you can apply the sulfur for economic returns? Um, I think we just we talked about what sulfurs to use. So, just... Sulfate is the readily available form that plants subtake. So traditionally to, let's say, fix a sulfur deficiency, um, sometimes we apply ammonium sulfate as, as a nitric concern too. The other things we look at um, to fix a sulfur deficiency might be potassium sulfate. And the other resource we might look at is sulfur mag, which is O22, which is 18% sulfur. There are tend to go to sources of sulfur to fix a sulfur deficiency. You know, that's that's what I would say. Do they ever use Epsom salts in corn? Magnesium sulfate or Epsom salts is very seldom done because I don't think its availability is is that readily you know, to the consumer compared to those other three sources I mentioned. It'd be probably a pretty expensive source of sulfur to use too. So. I think you also asked when, when would be the last point where you would add sulfur? I, I, as long as you can get to the stage. Field. To what stage? Um, I would say as long as you can get it into the field, uh, there's probably not much of a limitation because sulfur is going to be taken up pretty pretty quickly compared to other nutrients. And um, I, I don't think it would do much harm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have an NS ratio problem where your crop is turning yellow, then I think regardless of what stage you're at, you want to do something about that. And, and most of the time, from my experience, the sulfur deficiency is recognized fairly early in the season. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say, you know, usually I would say by V6 or V7. And I think at those stages, probably you can make an application and still improve the crop. I'm not sure. I don't have the uptake curve in my head for sulfur. I would think it's similar to some degree as nitrogen is. It, it is less mobile in the plant than nitrogen. Um, but um, that's what I would tend to believe without, you know, further looking at the uptake curve. Luke may have an idea or Ron may have an idea too with that. Yeah, I, I'm asking this question because he said um, N can be applied until VT stage and there is a possibility you can apply more nitrogen and then you can run into that um, NS balance imbalance. There, right. there, is a, there is a great publication by Bender that came out um, a few years ago, and it shows actually the uptake and utilization and translocation of all these nutrients with mm -hmm. corn growth. There's also a publication for soybeans. I will send that to Al and he can email it out to the group. I think that publication and understanding the translocation and uptake can be used as a guide to help growers know when these nutrients can be applied. And, and what the potential are for them to make differences at different growth stages. So that's something we'll send out to you. Dr. Yeah. Hardy, uh, Dr. Hicks shared that with me and then Dr. Get for corn and Gattaboni did. And I've got that on our website where people signed up for the training. They can go there and download those. But thank you for mentioning those. But that, yes, sure. those are, I can't imagine the, all the research that was behind that data. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's an excellent paper. Uh, Al, I would just add one other thing, which is, you know, that 
so in, when you're soil sampling in the fall, um, uh, you know, you get your, you get your recommendation. A lot can happen between then and, and, and whenever you're, you're planting, you know, as we've noticed, we've been having some very odd years of, uh, excessive rainfall at, at inconvenient times. And so one of the things that growers should want to know is like, is all that, all those nutrients that I put out, is all that fertilizer gone? Is it all leached past the rooting zone? Do I need to go out and reapply? And the tissue test is useful to do in season because it can help you determine whether or not um, your, your pre-plant's still there or not. So I just wanted to, to add that as well. Before we get off, I see people are leaving. I had a poll here very quickly if I could share. And then we'll make some closing comments. Uh, I'm going to launch it. If y'all would, the ones that are there, if you would just fill it out. As you know, with extension, we like to see if what we're doing is making a difference. So if y'all can do that, I'd appreciate it. I have just a, a final comment on, on this uh, question about uh, uh, in what stage you can apply nutrients. Uh, we have the plants are, are taking up nutrients uh, until V five, as as Ron uh, uh, said. But uh, I think the, the 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 big question is when we need to stop because after some of these stages we don't. We have some uptake of nutrients, but you cannot have profit from, from this fertilization. And you also have this uh, translocation of nutrients inside the plant. And so uh, when we are going late in the season, probably it doesn't work to apply these nutrients. And uh, this is a decision that is, is, is very hard to take. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that you know, one reason I want to share, this might be something that other agents might would try uh, to implement in their county. But with growers, uh, I would say, you know, some of our operations, I know in my county, you have a number of people involved in it, like, you know, like other family members. This could be something that one of those people could do um, is say, hey, we're going we're going to take tissue samples in maybe just corn this year and and this is your job. And I know that the agents in the counties would be glad to, to share with them how to do this. But I would say if, if a grower said, well, I just don't have the, the manpower. I don't have the time to do it myself. This might would be something that would be worth the money. And I'll let y'all chime in, you uh, panel members, about if you don't have the time, it might be something worth paying the money to get it done, is my question to y'all. What's your feelings? What are you asking now? You know, if a per farmer says, well, I do not have the time, the resources, the manpower to do this on my own, to do something sort of like this, tissue sampling, uh, would it be something worth their investment? I don't know what it would cost. So a consultant, whoever, somebody to do this for them. Would this yeah. be worth their money and uh, money to? I, I, mean, I think if they're trying to push high yields, you know, if they're really trying to push the envelope, I, I would investigate it myself, whether or not I did it myself or how to consult it and try to do it correctly. And I would probably pick some, some bills to guide me with that, maybe based on soil type or yield potential. So, yes, I would tend to encourage it, but I, I, to get a feel for it to see if it could help guide me. But um, that's what I would do if I was a grower. Um, you know, some consultants do it routinely, um, maybe more so for cotton and corn. But I, I think it somewhat depends on the grower and, and maybe their management and how much they, they feel like they can invest in the crop. You know, it's an individual yeah. decision. Yep, I'd agree with that 100%. I mean, if all you're trying to do is uh, get by, I mean, it's sort of like the wheat, uh, plant it and forget it. Why, I don't know that it's going to benefit you a lot, but if you're really interested in pushing a higher yields, uh, understanding uh, higher the factors that are most limiting the yield in your fa farm, well, I think a tissue sample then becomes a, a very useful tool to you because, say, this year you've got 
corn, good corn growth and everything, and you take a tissue sand, then next year you've got uh, even uh, worse conditions. Why? And you still got higher tissue costs. So you know what? You know what uh, factors are 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 you're limiting, and which ones are are positive. Furthermore, as Kristen said, after severe events, which we tend to have very recent uh, frequently, why having a tissue sample helps determine whether you're still on track, where your nutrient levels of uh, your uptake, you know, the issue here is uptake in most cases. It's, we got it in the soil. Do we have it in the plant? And a tissue sample tells you whether you're getting it into the plant. The, the other thing I think, Al, that I would um, like to mention to everyone, we had the four R's of nutrient management. The, the one, I think, key part that growers tend not to do the best job is timing and oftentimes they will apply a lot of nitrogen up front and some of that nitrogen once you apply it you run the risk of it getting gone somewhere either through leaching or denitrification or what have you i think we could do a better job on timing those nutrients like nitrogen sulfur even potassium or low cec soils and think about that aspect and you know, with, with the application to get a better job of overall utilization. One other point, person I'd like to point out that's with us today is Dr. Kaliza. And uh, I know that you are have been and are working on some videos on tissue sampling. Uh, do you want to just shout out about that and what you got planned? Yeah, sure. Uh, Ron has already been our first participant in that. So we're, we're trying. Luke and I are recording videos talking about waste sampling, soil sampling, tissue sampling, trying to get a portal page together. So everyone has a one-stop shop for resources regarding uh, tissue testing and all the other samples that go along with good nutrient management. Um, also, I started this because I was getting questions. You were you were one of those people who asked me if I could uh, provide some some tissue testing videos because uh, I had done it as part of a, a previous project. And so, I my interest is in the waste analysis realm. And so, um, how do we include this in waste management plans to help improve nutrient management? Um, if you are working with a grower who has a waste management plan, making sure that you understand how this can fit in. Yes, it can give you an indicator of availability and whether those nutrients are there, but also from a regulatory perspective, uh, if you're trying to adjust the allowable application rates, you have to have a regional agronomist come out and take those samples and give you an approval letter uh, for, you know, in expanding above what your allowable application rate is. So just because you need nutrients, if you're in a waste management plan, doesn't mean you can automatically go out and apply them. Got to make sure you have a letter from a regional agronomist to do that. So, um, so yeah, we're hoping to have that portal page up sometime around extension conference time uh, and available for, for agents and producers to get that info all in one place. Folks, we are approaching 1030. Uh, um, I imagine if anybody's got any more burning questions that any of the participants would be glad to answer those. But we are uh, approaching two hours and uh, but I do appreciate everybody's participation. I'd like to again thank Dr. Heiniger, Dr. Gattaboni, Dr. Uh, Hicks, Dr. Hardy, and Dr. Kaliza for their input on this program. And uh, hopefully this will generate some discussion about using this as a tool in managing our crops. Thank you all for everybody. Thanks, Al. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, Al. Al. Thank, thank you. Al. Bye. Bye.